Okay, I'm excited to get into God's Word. That's why we're really all here, is to not just celebrate what God is doing, but to also learn about what He's saying to us. Amen. Uh, so if we could turn to uh, 1 John chapter 4. As I said, this is going to be our main text. We are continuing our series in uh, the book of 1 John. And we are on the home stretch of 1 John. We are finishing up chapter 4 today. And next week we will finish the final chapter, the final saga of 1 John. And uh, it's, been, it's been rich. It's been a good series. Um, while you're there, I'm going to read a verse quickly from John the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and verse 13. And I wanted to start the message with this thought uh, today. And uh, if I can find it here. And it says, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. This is, of course, Jesus speaking. And, you know, Jesus is the ultimate example of true love, right? That sounds like kind of a corny saying, true love, right? We hear it a lot in movies. But really, Jesus is the example of true love, love that is 100% truth, that is not hiding behind anything, any, any kind of uh, selfish intentions. It is, a, it is a love that is 100% pure and true, and that is found in the example of Christ. And this example became known to us when Jesus became flesh, right? John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word. That's talking about Jesus, right? And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, right? We, we saw him. Certainly John, who wrote 1 John, saw Jesus with his own eyes, right? He, Jesus became our example of what love looks like, and it is now what we have as an example to um, emulate, right, as we go about our lives as Christians, we follow the example Jesus set before us of true love. Amen. And so let's turn to 1 John chapter 4. If you're there already, say amen. Amen. If you're there already, say hurry up, pastor. All right. Okay, 1 John chapter 4 and... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to split this up. I'm not going to read it all the way through. So we're starting in verse 13. And we're going to read all the way through the rest of the chapter uh, through 21. So verse 13 says, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. So I have a question. How does John know that God has given us the Holy Spirit. How does John know this? Well, let's remember. What was that? Did someone say something? Okay, I was hearing my echo or something. Okay. Well, let's look. Let's remember. John, remember, he had a first-hand account of the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Remember in Acts chapter 2, at Pentecost, what happened? Well, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to the apostles. And after Jesus ascended, his Holy Spirit came down, baptized the apostles in the Holy Spirit, and they began to what? They began to preach, right? Peter began to preach with this incredible boldness. And John witnessed all of this. And so certainly John knows about a thing or two about the Holy Spirit. And it says that, God has given us the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes you, you can read phrases and you can read words and they can be very meaningful to us, right? But sometimes you read a phrase and it's just, 
it contains so much power and so much meaning that it, you have to meditate on it. You have to read it over and over again. And sometimes it takes a while before it actually sinks into your heart. And certainly that's what this phrase does to me. It says, he has given us of his spirit. The spirit of the living God is in us today. If, if you are a follower of Christ, you have God's spirit within you. That's powerful. That's everything to the believer, right? To have God's spirit within us means that we no longer uh, have to live in our sin, means that we no longer have to rely on our own strength to accomplish things in life, right? Just as we were praying this morning, we were agreeing together because the spirit of God is here in our midst, right? The Spirit of God is within us today as believers. And how often are we guilty of going through life without even giving this a second thought, without even really thinking about this? You know, there are certain things about our character in the natural that, that we are always thinking about, right? There, there are certain character traits that when we are interacting with people day to day just comes out. It's natural, right? Some of us are, are funny. Some of us are, are not funny. Some of us are serious. Some of us uh, are very analytical. Some of us are very positive, right? These, these character traits that without even thinking about it, it just comes out of us. Well, I want to encourage you to dwell on this thought that God's Spirit is in you today. And this should be something that as the believer, it permeates our whole soul and heart to the core that when we talk, we should be breathing life. When we interact with others, it should be God's spirit coming out, right? Overflowing out of our heart to where people think, wow, this guy, this lady, they are, they're different. There's something about them that's, that's just edifying and positive and and uplifting and meaningful. That's how I want to be. That's, that's my desire is that it wouldn't be something that we have to read every now and then and be like, oh yeah, I have the Holy Spirit living in me. Oh yeah. No, it would be just something that comes out. Okay, so, so that's kind of the idea that I think that John is, is wanting to really press in to the reader today as we go through is that God's presence is within us. God's presence dwells in us. In the Old Testament, you had to go to the tabernacle. You had to present, you had, you had to have the, the high priest go in and petition the Lord on your behalf. You weren't even allowed into the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God. Only the appointed high priest could, could do that. We have access to God today, unlimited access. Not only do we have unlimited access, he's here with us right now. It's not that we have to go somewhere. We don't have to come into this building to see the Holy Spirit move. No, the Holy Spirit lives within us. Those of us who believe in Jesus Christ today, he is dwelling within us. And the, another great thing about that is that this gives us an assurance that we are bought, that we are, um, that, that the debt has been paid for us today, right? This is our assurance that as we go about our lives, as we are becoming more and more like Christ, this is an assurance for us that on the day of judgment, we have nothing to fear because he has bought, he has paid the price for our sin and we are now in Christ today. I want to read another passage that kind of leaves our main text today in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 uh, and 14. I'm going to read verse 13 first and then say a little bit about what this is saying. In him you also trusted 
after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I want us to look at this word sealed. This is, of course, the Apostle Paul writing to the church. And what he's speaking of there in that word sealed is, is an official mark. Okay? At that time, the king would seal a letter with his, with his seal, right? An important document, a letter, something of high importance. It would be sealed. And this is what this is the idea that Paul is conveying to the believer is that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Having this mark means that we are under the authority and ownership of whose seal we bear, of, of whose seal is on us. We are under the authority of, of Christ, and we are under the ownership of Christ. When we commit our hearts to Christ, when we say, I believe in, in you, Jesus, I repent of my sin, you are my Savior, at that very moment we are sealed in we are sealed in Christ. And so the question many ask is, when does being sealed, when does this being sealed with the Holy Spirit take place? And the answer is, at the moment of belief. At the moment of belief. Verse 14, first, sorry, Ephesians 1, uh, verse 14 says, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? So we are sealed in the Holy Spirit, and this is God's promise of eternal life in him. That yes, we, we are sealed in the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit living within us, yet we dwell here on earth, right? We're not saved and then immediately in glory with Christ. And hopefully through this series and through your life as a believer, you've come to the knowledge of the reason why. Because we are called to be the light of the world. And so as long as there's breath in our lungs, you know, we sang about it this morning, it's your breath in our lungs. We're going to pour out our praise to Jesus, but we're also going to uh, take on the mandate of the Great Commission, which is to go and disciple the nations, to preach the gospel to all who will hear. And until Christ returns, we have this promise of eternal life when Jesus returns or when we go pass from this life to the next. Amen? 1 John 4, verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. The Father has sent His Son as Savior of the world. Now, I really like the beginning of this verse. We have seen and testify. Again, John is reminding the church, reminding us, I've seen Jesus with my own two eyes. Right? I, I've seen Him. Okay? And so, just know that I, 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 Jesus is who He said He was. And I saw it with my own two eyes. It was not a secondhand account that I present this before you today. But he also says, we've seen and testify that the Father sent the Son as Savior of the world. This phrase, testify that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world, this, this is a posture of gratitude and celebration, right? When we, when we have seen the Lord, when we come to belief in Christ, this compels us to testify of the gospel, right? How many of you have ever been saved by somebody? This is kind of a, an extreme example because it doesn't happen all the time, but I have, a, I have a testimony like this where when I was a kid, I almost got hit by a car. I'll just, I'll just tell the story real quick. I was leaving uh, Mr. Gaddy's, okay, not the one here in Fredericksburg. There I was living in San Antonio, and there used to be one right up the street from the church, and it was after church on a Sunday. I'm, I'm 
you know, back, back in those days, you know, way back when, uh, I used to wear my um, nice dress shoes and nice dress pants and suspenders and a belt with my shirt tucked in and a nice dress shirt and a clip-on tie, and I was the cutest little thing you ever saw. But I was about, I think, four years old at the time. And we're eating at Mr. Gaddy's, having a good old time, and we're there with uh, some members of our church. And in fact, I remember who it was. It was a, a, a former elder at our church. His name was Jeff Stevens. Okay, and this guy was about 6'5", uh, awesome, awesome guy. And anyway, we were eating there. We were done eating. We were leaving the parking. We were leaving the restaurant, heading into the parking lot. And me being, you know, a rebellious four-year-old, just bolted for the parking lot. How many of you have ever seen a kid just just dart and it's just like, I just hope, I just hope. That's all you can say. You can't you can't reach out and grab them. There's nothing you can do. It, it's just you know they're they're out of your reach and you're just hoping and praying that they don't nothing bad happens to them. Well, that's what was happening to me. So I start bolting to the parking lot and. My dad is standing kind of like here, and I, I bolt in front of him. Well, Jeff Stevens was about, I don't know, five or 10 feet in front of my dad. Well, right in front of Jeff was the, the road that separated, you know, the first row of parking from the second row of parking. So the first row of parking, and then I'm running right into the middle of the street. Well, as that's happening, some guy with road rage, or maybe he had bad pizza, I don't know, he starts bolting across the parking lot, of totally oblivious that I'm running right in front of his car. And I'm running, I mean, I'm just, you know, just not even having a care in the world. I run, and I just feel this yank on my right arm, pulls me back, and this car just goes right by me, probably... I don't know, 20 miles an hour right there in the parking lot. And I turn around, and, and Jeff Stevens is just locked onto my arm. Just He had grabbed me. He had saved me. And obviously, my parents were very grateful that he had gone ahead a little bit and that he had the awareness to reach out and grab me. But I probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Jeff Stevens, right? And... And I'm even telling you this today because it left an impact on my, on, on my life. I mean, how many of y'all have a, have a story like that? Maybe, okay? Where someone has physically saved your life. Or you could attribute maybe someone intervening in your life that really saved you from really messing up big time, okay? Well, when that happens, we want to tell people about it, right? I've told that story to probably hundreds of people. I won't get into it this morning, but my wife has an amazing story of how God saved her from drowning when she was a baby. And if it wasn't for that miraculous intervention, I mean, I wouldn't have any children today. Uh, you know, well, I wouldn't have these children. So, But anyway, that's another story. But God has sustained her. God has sustained me. And I want to tell about it. I want to, I want to tell about how the, the, this man, Jeff Stevens, saved my life, okay? So all that to say, when someone saves your life, it compels you to share about it. It's just a natural thing, right? It, this, you, you think about how, how you could have died, right? Where you could have been, and how now you're living this almost like a second life, like a new life right? This is what it means to be saved. This is what it means to be purchased by Christ, that we were dead in our sin, right? We were dead. We were walking zombies, right? We're alive here on this earth, but we are dead. We are dead in our sin. And what happened? Jesus saved us. Jesus paid the price for our sin. We now are new creations. Amen. And this should compel us to testify of this good news to anyone who will listen. Because the same way Jesus saved us, 
He can save them, right? And we have this good news, and so this should stir us up today that it's not just something, you know, there's that, there's that song we used to sing in Sunday school. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Y'all want to sing it today? No, I didn't think so. Okay. Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine, right? Hide it under a bushel? No. I'm going to let it shine. That's what that song is about. It's letting your light shine. Sharing the gospel. Testifying of the work that Christ did in me, that Christ has done in you. Amen. Another reason we do it is because this guy named Jesus told us to do it. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. I hear pages, so I'm going to wait a second. Isn't that like the greatest sound in the world? Pages are turning up. The, The... the turning pages of the Bible. Amen. Okay, verse 15. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. I just want to highlight something. When you share the gospel, you can't leave out that last part. Okay? There is a heaven, praise God. There is a hell. Okay, that's reality. And an easy way to to think about that is God is holy. God is good, right? Anything absent from a good and holy God is evil and ugly and wicked. And so if you think of heaven, heaven is everything good, everything holy, everything perfect. Hell is the opposite of that. Because without God... There is nothing good. There is nothing righteous. And so to be without God for all eternity, that's hell. That is hell. That is a picture of hell. To be condemned in your sin for all eternity is the life and and what awaits those of us who do not believe in Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus had to die. That is why he had to pay the penalty of our sin on the cross to save us from that, to redeem us so that we can be in right standing with God for all eternity. This is the good news of the gospel, that as we believe, we won't be condemned. We will be brought in to the family of God as his children. Amen. Okay, now, another thing that this shows us is, we know last week was our missions conference, and we had a live stream fail up here last week. Y'all remember that? Anybody? That was kind of fun. We tried to live stream. Well, y'all were here. Y'all saw what happened. And uh, God still moved. God still worked. Uh, But we had a live stream. It didn't work out so well. But what I ended up sharing with you all when I was sharing my heart for missions is that world missions is God's heartbeat. World missions is the heartbeat of God. And just like verse 14 of 1 John tells us that we see and testify, right, that that the Son is the Savior of the world, that's, that's, that's world missions. That's being a missionary. That's spreading the gospel to every nation. And certainly in Mark chapter 16, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's world missions. So God has a heart for every nation of the world, not just Fredericksburg, not just the United States, for every nation. God has a heart for every soul. And it's our job to be image bearers of God to be those who will bring the good news to a dying, lost world. That's that's our commission today. Verse 15, 1 John 4, verse 15. 
Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Now we learn that our life is now sealed in the Holy Spirit, right? We read that from Ephesians. And God's life now dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. This is what being a new creation is talking about. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says we are now a new creature. We are new. We are not our same old flesh, our same old self. We have died to our flesh, and we are now alive through God's Spirit, through the Holy Spirit that lives within us. God's life literally dwells within us today. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. You know, we've heard that phrase, knowledge is power, right? That's not knowledge is power, John 3, 16. No, it's, it's not in the Bible, but it's, it, is, it is true nonetheless. Knowledge is power. We know, we have that knowledge that God loves us. We should have this knowledge as believers, right? The gospel message starts with how God loves us. Right, John 3, 16, God so loved the world. He didn't send Jesus because he didn't see any other way to have the universe exist. It, was, it started with his love for us. Right, he didn't flood us again. He didn't wipe the whole earth clean like he did in the Old Testament, right? He didn't do that. Why? Well, he had promised he wouldn't do that. And second, because he loved us and he wanted to redeem us. And so we need to know this in our heart today, that God loves us. The reason we need to know, number one, it gives us confidence in who he is. It gives us confidence in who God is, the character of God, that he loves his children. How many of you, let's just say growing up, right, you, you maybe had a father figure in your life or someone in your life that was older than you, that you knew had your back, that you knew loved you, probably gave you confidence anytime you were with that person, right? My children, when they're in a dark room, when it's late at night, as soon as I walk into the room, they feel safe, right? It's that knowledge that I love them, and so I'm gonna do everything I can to protect them. I'm gonna do everything I can to walk with them. It's the same thing for the believer. It gives us confidence today when we know who God is, when we know that he loves us. It also gives us confidence in who we are through him, in who we are as his children that we are overcomers. We're, we're not dead in our sin, we are overcomers. And the third thing that this knowledge gives us is boldness because of who he is. We now have boldness knowing that God loves us and God redeemed us. This should give us boldness to proclaim the good news of Christ to anyone who will listen. It would also give us boldness to proclaim the good news of Christ to anyone who would deny that word, to anyone who would come against what we are saying, who would persecute us for our faith, right? We need to have a boldness to stand up for God's word in the midst of a world that's in the midst of a country and a nation that wants to deny everything that has to do with a holy God, with there being one way, right? That's what's coming against us today. We're gonna see more and more attacks come against the church of God, but we know that we have the Holy Spirit living within us, and we know that we can stand up in boldness to proclaim the truth. That is my decree to you today. That is the heart of God. That is the heart of the Apostle John as he's telling us that we know and believe the love God has for us. 
Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 19. We love him because he first loved us. He first loved us. We need to understand today that that we who are in Christ, we have nothing to fear on the day of judgment. Verse 17 says, we have nothing to fear. That should give us boldness today, right? That whether whether we perish in this life before Christ returns or whether Christ comes back before we perish, it doesn't matter because we know that we are redeemed. We know that on the day of judgment, when we go before God, what does it say in verse 17? It says, because as he is, so are we in this world. What that is saying is that when we get to the pearly gates, right, on the day of judgment, God is going to see us as he sees Jesus. He's going to count us as righteous, right? Because we have the, the spirit of God living in us. We have been purchased. We have been bought. We have been redeemed. And so God doesn't see us in our sin any longer. He sees us as righteous, overcoming children of the King of Kings. Amen? We need to know this. We need to understand this. We need to be living like this, living in boldness, not living in fear, not living in this idea, on this idea and way of thinking that God is judging his people today, right? That bad things happen because God's inflicting his judgment on you. That's not how we are to live today. God loves us. We are his children. Jesus has the victory over death. So when we experience pain in this life, when we experience tragedy in this life, Jesus has the victory over death. And those who have gone before us, who have lived their life for the Lord, they have this promise. For all eternity, they will be with the King of kings and the Lord of lords as they are God's children. And we can walk free of all fear, right? We don't have to fear. And in fact, we shouldn't fear because it says in verse 18, perfect love casts out fear. We have the perfect love of God living within us. It says fear involves torment. There's no torment in the love of God. The love of God is perfect love of God is perfect. So we need to walk free from all fear today. Verse 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. These two verses really summarize the entire fourth chapter of 1 John. You know, we've, we've learned throughout this chapter, and certainly it's reflected here in, in these verses, that loving other believers is a mark that we love God, right? We should be loving one another, right? We should be encouraging one another, building each other up. This is a mark that that the Holy Spirit is working within us. This is an evidence that we are children of God. And we remember what Jesus had to say in Matthew 22, when he was talking about the, the greatest commandments in Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40. I want to read this quickly today as we close.
Jesus is so, so wise. He is so wise. I just love reading the, the, the words of Jesus. Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40. It says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying, on these two commandments hang all the law of Moses. All the Old Testament law can be summarized in these two commandments. If you obey these two commandments, you're fulfilling the law of God. You're fulfilling God's law. And what this means for us today is that we, just, just as John is saying, that if someone says, I love God and hate my brother, I'm a liar. And you might read that and say, man, that's kind of harsh. But Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Right? This is the first and greatest commandment. The second, love your neighbor as yourself. So these are, these are the commandments of Jesus. This is Jesus now telling us exactly what John is saying. If you follow Jesus, you will obey these commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. I want to close with this. We need to remember that we bear witness of who God is to the world today. Men and women of God, men and women who carry the name of Jesus, who proclaim to be Christians, who proclaim to be followers of Jesus Christ, we are the image bearers of the Almighty God on this earth. This is our mandate. This is why Jesus said, this is, these are the greatest commandments. Not thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, Obviously, we don't do those things. Right? If you love your neighbor, you're not going to kill them. You're not going to steal from them. Okay? See how, the, how it fulfills the law really quickly when you start reading through all the Ten Commandments. But Jesus is also saying this because we have to know that if we are not loving, we are not reflecting a true image of God because God is love. Right? God's love is perfect. And John has just showed us that we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We have God's perfect love within us. Is that what we are reflecting to the world? That is what we should be reflecting to the world today. The world is going to see God when they see the people of God living in true love. Living in self-sacrificial love. When they see the people of God proclaiming the good news of the gospel, not giving in to the, the lies of the enemy, not giving in to what the world would say is right today, but pressing forward in all boldness and truth. This is what love really is. And this is what a lost world needs today. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak through your word. As we read it, it comes to life. Lord, you live in us today. The Holy Spirit is living within us today. We thank you for the price you paid so that we could have the Holy Spirit within us today. That you could live through us. That you could go before us. Lord, help us to be responsible image bearers of you today. Help us to, to disciple others to do the same. To not be cavalier with their faith. But to, to respect it and revere it with all manner of importance. 
that the gospel message is the only way. The gospel message is the only saving message. It's a message the world needs today. And help us to live lives of, of joy and, and gratitude Lord, for what you've done in us, that it, that it would just bubble over in every area of our life so that we, we could be a perfect reflection of who you are. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you today. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you soon. Bless you.